You're listening to the Talking Forest Podcast with your host, Kendra Burns. In today's world, it's important to communicate your story online, and Kendra can help you by diving into social media and providing you with free tips and insights on how to build your organic social media following and shine online. Having been raised low income, first in her family to go to college, and a proud international military spouse, Kendra develops creative media content across many social media platforms from anywhere in the world. Her inspiration comes from the people who give her hope and believe in her so she can believe in you. Follow the Talking Forest podcast today to see how she lives the dream of a traveling virtual entrepreneur and get your tech tips as we keep up with the latest on social media. Hi, this is Kendra from the Talking Forest podcast, and I'm really excited to bring on a guest from a professor from Clemson University. Patrick Heisel, and I'm so excited because he has wanted to help me talk about the Cradle of Forestry, the Appalachian Society of American Foresters Centennial Monument that has just been put up, and the historical importance of Carl Schenck in the German forestry, which he brought to the USA. So I'll have you introduce yourself, Patrick. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Kendra. This is great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited because you have the experience in the German side and you've been working in the USA um, in the forest management part of um, Clemson. And I'm excited because I already knew uh, Pat Layton. She's from the Wood Institute. And I've been talking with uh, Dr. Dave Coyle from entomology. So it's really cool that um, I'm now starting to talk to more diverse people, and you're one of them that was mentioned to be able to talk about uh, the Cradle of Forestry and the APSAP Monument for the Centennial. So um, what is your your background and how did you get to working at Clemson in the forest management part? That is a very good question. So my background is kind of diverse. With, I didn't start out in forestry, started out in computer sciences, got some computer software development background. And then I switched into forestry, got an undergrad in Germany, did that forest management um, track there for four years, and then by chance moved to the US and started doing my master's and PhD up at the University of Maine. And then, you know, had the opportunity to interview at Clemson for a position in forest operations which is the field of study that I'm in. And I got the position and I've been teaching down here at Clemson ever since. And since I moved down to South Carolina in 2015, I have been, you know, slowly getting involved with SAF some more than I, you know, more involvement than I had as a student. And I started working on the local chapters, our Kiwi chapter, you know, working as a treasurer and then our chair. And then most recently moving up more on the regional level with APSAF and working on this APSAF Centennial Monument project that we just completed earlier this year. So it's been really exciting doing this. And then also along the way, learning about Carl Schenk, you know, what he has done and kind of getting excited about the fact that a German forester came over here, started that forestry school and and started doing some really good or introduced some forest management practices and you know i've been catching up on him ever since i started moving down to south carolina and to be honest i do not remember ever hearing of him when i was studying in germany yeah and same here in the usa i actually didn't know of him until 2015 when i heard of the america's first forest video and it's a documentary of him bringing forestry um, practices to the United States. And from what I was seeing, um, I went to college for five years in uh, forestry, forest management, and was working in the sector um, as an intern. And my experience and then my knowledge of sustainability um, was something that we were just doing, but I didn't know where it came from. And I think the origin of being able to plant um, three to four trees for every one that we take out of the forest um, was something that the Vanderbilt family in the Biltmore estate was actually taught by Carl Schenck. And I believe you're correct. If I first think back about my um, 
undergraduate classes in Germany, I think sustainability was coined by one of the German foresters back in the day, I think in the early 1700s already. And I believe there's actually a documentation of that from 1713 by Hans Karl von Karlowitz, who back in the day already described the process of sustainability. And I think ever since it flew, it, it kind of flowed into the education in, in Germany and in Central Europe. And then, you know, if you think about the Fendbild, um family with having ties to Gifford Pinchot, who was then educated in France and then across Europe. So I'm sure that he brought a lot of those concepts back home over here into the U.S. and then implemented those here as well. Yeah, and I'm really happy for it. Um, I actually went to the Seyfeld Forest with some foresters that were friends with my forestry group in Washington State SAF, and I was able to document legacy trees. And what had happened is that our Douglas fir seed bank um, ended up in Germany, but it was imported later um, in the 40s and 50s. And so now those trees are over 100 years old in Seyfeld, and they have been using uh, harvests that they've invested in in Washington state to fund uh, rebuilding their, their castle. And they've actually rebuilt a bridge out of that. And so a lot of these points of connection, I'm speaking to a German, I used to live in Germany, we have German foresters who are friends with foresters in the States. And I think that even though we're on different continents, we're actually quite connected. Absolutely. It's always surprising in forestry how small our world really is and how many people are connected across the globe. You know, just knowing each other, having worked in different countries, just like you spent some years in Germany, learn something about forestry over there and then come back here and then put the picture together with like more information, with a broader view of forest management and maybe some of the ties and the history and what happened to, you know, exchange some of the knowledge. I have been, absolutely. And what blew me away was the public ownership of land in Germany and how the foresters are actually open to letting recreation and everything happen and it's not as privatized. So what that meant is I could leave my backyard, go into a forest and I wasn't trespassing. I know that 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 is really mind boggling when I present something like that to my students in class too. It's like, yes, you can walk through anybody's forest if you want to. And you can you can pick mushrooms if, if you really so desire and walk through there and do some hikes. The only restriction is, in, in most cases, that you cannot bring a motorized vehicle into a forest road, into a forested area. Yeah. But as long as you walk or bike, you can do that and you have access to, you know, hundreds and thousands of acres in, in your neighborhood, basically, to just explore and wander through. Yeah. Um, also, there's some trials that are meant for bicycles only. And I remember I was in... Um, Austria in the Alps, my husband and I were hiking uh, the Highline, Highline, it was in Root, Austria, I believe, and we were hiking between um, two castles that were on two separate mountains that had a Highline bridge, and um, I remember going down this bike trail because it was easier and it, it was starting to get dark, and all of these cyclists kept on saying, verboten, verboten, and I was like, oops, um, we're forbidden from being on this um however no one ever stopped and like told us to not be there they were just yelling verboten as they were going down the the pike well you got fully immersed into the german culture right there <laughs> that happens all the time and like i do the same thing I, I like to walk on those bike paths too and it's like but the germans are very they're, they're stickless for the details like if you have a line where one half is walking one half is bike lane then keep uh. it that way because they're very aggressive yeah. when it comes to having their space and everything oh yes my husband pulled me into the pedestrian walking area a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um that's been really interesting and and so yeah that culture was a lot different and i've been able to be an asset here and understanding forestry and the sustainability of it and bringing in um, biomass and talking about using small diameter uh, logs for everything that we can possibly use it for and just utilizing as much as we can uh, when things have to come out of the woods and, and be thinned. And lately I've been doing a lot of podcasts on wildfire mitigation and I also have one um, coming in your area with a, uh, a sawmill, which is in your background. 
and um, they have been removing small diameter wood and laminating it to make it into uh, siding and panels that can be actually used, which is considered an upgrade um, from it going to a pulp mill or ending up uh, in a biomass facility, so or a, a chip facility for animal bedding or something. But they also do that as well. Um, so it's more well-rounded, and I think that the cradle of forestry is a great place for people to learn that. And so um, talk to me about the cradle of forestry and the background of that, and then we'll go into the APSAF Centennial Monument. All right, I can do this. So the Cradle of Forestry, the information I have is basically what I picked up from Jeff Owen, the recreation manager out there who works with the U.S. Forest Service on the Pisgah Ranger District. So to kind of quote him that the Cradle of Forestry kind of got established in 1968 through a congressional mandate, right? And I think it consists of about 6,500 acres of forest land with the mandate being to I quote, to promote, demonstrate, and stimulate interest in professional forest management, end quote here. So that, that's a very powerful mandate right here. And I think if you have been to the cradle, I know you have and I have, and everybody else that visits the cradle of forestry, I think gets, gets exactly that, that there is a promotion, there's the demonstrations, and there's just, it, it really stimulates some interest in professional forest management. And, you know, one thing that the U.S. Forest Service that manages the Cradle of Forestry really does well is partnering with other organizations. One of these organizations is Find Outdoors, which is a nonprofit organization down in Pisgah Forest that actually manages the educational content. And they were also a big partner with us, with APSEF, when we established that um, monument. And then the Forest Service also works very well with SAF, the Society of American Foresters, and in particular now with us, with APSAF, the Appalachian Society of American Foresters, one of the state societies within SAF. And, and working with everybody together on how can we celebrate 100 years of professional forest management in the Appalachian region was just a pleasure and because everybody pulled on the same string and we all had the same ideas of educating, promoting for professional forest management, we got together and we were able to put this monument that you have seen and you know that's in many pictures around APSEF has been placed at the cradle of forestry now. Yeah, I was absolutely excited to land in North Carolina. Um, didn't even know that we'd be here because in the military they send you where they send you and you have to strap your boots up and uh, go. So I got really excited because I was from the Washington State area, which is a very big logging community, and I was raised in it. And people ask me how I got into forestry. I said I was born in this. I didn't really have a choice. I was with hunters, fishers, um, loggers, foresters, and I went to a college that was Grace Harbor College, which was the Chokers, meaning... Uh, <laughs> The choker, which is the line that pulls up the log for a cable logging, um, the person is a choker setter. So, and then I went to a college that was um, in the coast of um, the Olympia area, which is the capital of my state, and their mascot was the gooey duck, which is also a large clam that no one really knows about. And so uh, it was just fun to be raised in that and then I lived there for 27 years, and then we ended up in Germany, where I lived in southwest Germany. I was 30 minutes from the border of France. I actually went to Cora to get some of my groceries sometimes, um, since it was fresh, and um, Globus was okay, but we like to, to venture out pre-COVID um, and just drive across to get some groceries and fresh fish from the market. Um, and so I learned in Germany a lot about the culture and sustainability and very detailed work and then landed in North Carolina and learned that North Carolina is first in forestry. And I was trying to figure out what that actually meant. And I think what we're talking about today really does ring true that it's been 100 years, um, which is a long time in, in new America. But in Europe, a hundred years is minuscule because I go to castles and they're from the 1100s. Um, so to us, this is new. Um, and it's really good that we've been carrying on this legacy of um, sustainable forest management. 
So talk more about the process. How long did the APSAF monument kind of take to to figure out? And I'm sure there were some drafts of what was going to be said on the plaque and that it was a really shiny plaque when I went there, but um, maybe someone will end up cleaning it if moss grows on it. Um, so how does that kind of work in the background since you know that knowledge? Well, it took us about a year and a half once we really got started on selecting the site and working with the wording and everything to to come up with the final version. But I think the actual process started way before. I think if I remember correctly, I think as early as 2017, there was already some talks about that centennial for apps have coming up in a few years and we should do something extraordinary. And the people that were involved at the time came up with these ideas, you know, slowly moved this forward, presented it to their leadership team. And then I got involved with this whole project just at the beginning of 2020, right? At one of our app staff winter meetings, talked to, you know, a few people, especially Pat Strucker, who, who was a well-known figure within app staff who, who started working on this project, kind of pushing it forward, making sure that we have something nice to celebrate for our 100 year anniversary and we started looking at, at the beginning into different sites right the big question was if we create a monument where do we place it absolutely you know? and if you think back about APSAF, APSAF was founded in 1921 in Asheville so obviously it would be very nice to have a monument in Asheville. And I think initially we thought about the Biltmore Estate, which would be a great choice, but it would limit people from visiting it because there's an entrance fee and I think it's, it's fairly significant. So you're kind of excluding a lot of people that just want to go to see the monument and not um, venture out and see other things. Then we thought about putting it somewhere in a park in Asheville. But then the question is like, you know, who goes to Asheville, what park, who maintains it, and what happens to it after this celebration is over, and then it just sits in a park and nobody really knows about it. And it was really interesting. We, we got people involved, and we get Mary Morrison from the U.S. Forest Service involved at one point, and we started talking about the Cradle of Forestry being a really great spot to place a monument to provide public access and then have it all connected with forestry, forest management, and all kinds of other educational programming where it can be tied in. And, you know, I had some ties with Find Outdoors, the organization that does the educational um, components up there. And we all started pulling together and getting approval from the U.S. Forest Service, from Find Outdoors, to, you know, consider placing a monument at the cradle and have Find Outdoors help us in maintaining um, ah. the monument. Right. You know, you need to cut the grass around the monument. You need to make sure it's visible yes. and, you know, it probably takes the occasional cleaning or something. So it's, it's not something that you can just put there and leave. And, you know, we started meeting with everybody and trying to figure out where we could place this monument at the cradle that it's meaningful. And man, we, we got really lucky working so well with everybody that um, the U.S. Forest Service and Find Outdoors offered us a spot, literally right outside of their main building on one of their um, forest trails. Like, I mean, it's like a prime spot where you get almost every single visitor at the Great Law Forest to pass by our monument. And then, you know, once we had that said, that, that happened early on in 2020. We knew where we were going to put it, but the wording took probably about a year to figure out with many iterations of very lengthy text, you know, and everybody wants to, you know, provide all the information like, okay, we were founded in Asheville. This is what happened. This is how many people were involved. And, you know, we were like, wow, this is great text, but you have to engrave it in a stone. Right. You, you only have so many words to do that. And, you know, after a lot of discussion and many, many revisions with a lot of people being involved, we eventually came down to providing a, snapshot of why that monument is placed where it is placed and then providing a brief snapshot of the history on the backside of that monument so that we can capture people that are interested with three four sentences this is why this monument is placed here this is what it means 
And then if you're really interested and start exploring it, you find a little more about the details on the backside, when exactly it was formed and why it's, why it's there and, and how it all plays together with professional forest management. Yeah, I think it's a great celebration monument for sure. And I was impressed by the wording and I didn't get lost. I think it was uh, complimentary uh, to the location. Absolutely. And we had a very nice unveiling ceremony that we had um, hosted within APSA. We actually unveiled the monument on Arbor Day. So what was it, April 30th this year? We had a nice little celebration. Because of COVID, we had to have it um, virtually which was yes. not quite what we had anticipated, but yeah. we had this virtual, you know, celebration with about 50, 60 people participating online. And we, we had 20 or so people from the US Forest Service, from APSAF and, and from Find Outdoors in person on site as well. And we were hosting the virtual meeting from the site and combined it with some other meetings. And we had a really nice celebration with guest speakers, very high, high up guest speakers from the US Forest Service, you know, reiterating the importance of all of our different agencies and, and um, organizations to work together to work on this promotion, demonstration, and also that stimulation of interest in professional forest management. Yeah, and as I approached Cradle of Forestry and the Find Outdoors volunteers were going around and making sure that people had answers to their questions or making sure that kids had their interactive backpacks, um, I started to mention about my forestry background and that I've gone to forestry school and um, started forestry and they said, come sign our book. Um, and being able to sign a book with other foresters is really cool in, in, in person um, and to have that record. And so I think that as a go-to place for people to stop and see and understand forestry has been much, much needed and, you know, more they in the state parks, they call them interpretive centers. But I think that this is more than that. And it's definitely got uh, every aspect of forestry and people can learn more. Um, you did bring up the Biltmore Estate, and that was something that was on my journey because it was part of um, the Carl Shank history. And there was something I learned in that um, tour, I went through some of the outbuildings and I saw that uh, Gifford Pinchot ended up being Carl Shank's predecessor. And I didn't put two and two together, but that was really interesting because growing up in Washington State in the Cascade Mountains, Gifford Pinchot is like a founding father. And I also see Carl Shank as a founding father as well. I know this is quite an interesting development how all the people that we know from history that were very influential are somehow connected with each other. And it was that when Vanderbilt decided to do forest management on their property, what is now, I think, mostly the Pisgah Ranger District, that he started to looking for a forester. And I think because of some connection that he had, Gifford Pincher got hired to take on that responsibility, but I don't think Gifford Pincher stayed there very long. I don't have all the history facts straight, but I think he stayed there about a year, year and a half. I may be wrong with that, but yeah. it's a short period of time. And then Gifford Pinchot basically suggested to hire Carl Schenk. And I think they crossed paths at one point or got recommended through a third person. Anyhow, in the end, Carl Schenk got brought over because yeah. Gifford Pinchot moved on to bigger and better things. And then Carl Schenk, then, as we all know, started establishing the first forestry school in America. And that was just in the late 1890s. Yeah, and that little first forestry school um, is really fun to go visit as well because it's just a tiny wooden, wooden school building um, that you would normally see in old historic towns in the States anyway. Um, schools in Germany are much different and um, yeah, I live next to a, a Grün school. So I was able to see the um, elementary kids and it was really cool to actually talk to them because I live next to a, a Spielplatz, which is a play park. And I was able to see uh, kids in Germany when I lived there and their excitement and um, the way that they were raised I, I was noticing was a lot different. They were raised by a village. 
Um, and so there were at times no parents watching them in the park, but all of the neighbors were. They were watching. Um, and so these kinds of things are different. And I'm really glad that that diversity of culture came to America because we are now able to see different ways of doing things. And that's what I see as um, Carl brought in a school. But it's funny because he he built that um wooden school and he he utilized American resources um, and what he had at the time and it's it's while it's quite small it's it's mighty in the education power that it brought and the culture that it brought absolutely you're so right with that and and what Carl Schenk did at the cradle here with that forestry school that he had is is really amazing so if you ever have a chance anybody that's listening to this to go out there and take one of the guided tours through the cradle especially on that path of Carl Schenk to look at the school building and, and see how it was set up and what was utilized and then look at all the other outbuildings even just the office and and some of the buildings that have this very European influence on them with like that timber frame structure that's open exposed just the way you would find that if you go into mostly southern Germany. Yeah, exactly. And that's what was really cool is I got to meet um, German foresters and also French designers. And I went to Elsass or El Alsace. It was an Elsass dialect, which means French German. Um, and they were speaking German in France. Um, it was so interesting to, for me to see that, but that was on all of the borders of all the countries. So Switzerland had a German dialect, Austria had a German dialect. Um, and what I learned was that it was just a little bit of culture um, that got brought in and the exposed timber and the um, traditional German housing where you have the, the wood as a layer and you have um, even they paint the house um, pink or, or blue or purple and but you still have that exposed wood and it always reminded me of Beauty and the Beast every time because that's that's what I, I as a kid remember um, and there were some towns I went into that were um, totally with the uh, Edelweiss um, bells that were on all the cattle and everything and I'm wearing my Edelweiss uh, flower charm here um, always enjoyed going to the Alps and um, it, actually the first place I visited when I went to Germany was the Black Forest. So. Absolutely. Black Forest is a very nice place and I totally agree with any, everything you've said. There's, there's so much diversity happening overseas and that kind of across the boundary, across the, the, uh, the country borders. Right, speaking German, French, you have this mix, you have that history that's been happening there, you have all the different dialects, and you have these little cultural activities from the Edelweiss to the, um, to the bells hanging on the cows, and that changes depending where you go. And I, I really like the, this cultural difference, and you know, if you look across the U.S. today, you see a lot of that happening in Europe. I mean, I just look into the academic setting, into the educational setting, and there's so much diversity happening here with faculty from multiple different countries. You now have graduate students from multiple different countries, and everybody brings their little piece of culture over here. And if you think about the U.S. as a whole, it's one big country of multiple different cultures that all arrive from different countries coming over here at the beginning. Yes, even I'm quarter Canadian. Um, my grandma was full Canadian, great aunt, full Canadian, and um, they've arrived from Manchester, England. So England, Canada, and the reason why we're from Seattle, Washington is because my grandmother had a child out of wedlock. Um, they sent her to Seattle, Washington, and I'm from Washington State when she had my, my mom. Yeah, so <laughs> it's crazy, but yeah, we're literally a meld of cultures and um, that's the favorite, my favorite thing about going to a research conference is being able to see not only students work, but also their culture and where they're from, because it isn't, um, you know, one in that room anymore. It's multiple. Absolutely. You have multiple different cultures and, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting to learn about different cultures, to learn a little bit about the history 
And I utilize that in, in my coursework a lot to look into this and how has things developed and that brings back Schenk, you know, into classroom, like how German had an influence, but then you have Pincho and how French education had an influence, you know, and, and then you look over into Europe and see what's happening there and how forest management, which is more or less the same thing that happens here, happens on a much different scale. Yeah, absolutely. It does. And so we had to learn how to uh, slow down. And I think now of all times, climate change is really showing itself in the weather and everything. And so I think that culture coming to us when it did um, in the late 1800s was much, much needed because creating a land that is barren is no longer serving us as people or the earth. And so that was really good that we had um, the ability to have those cultural perspectives come in. And then now all over the United States, as I've been traveling, I always go look at um, forest practices laws and they are there in place. And when people get upset about overcutting or, you know, wildfire, there are ex experts and specialists that are working very hard to help mitigate all of these things. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, you know, one thing that just listening to you and like, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're preserving and we're, we're making decisions to to make sure that we have force, you know, you know, in, into the future here and we don't just have barren land. That brings me then, the, you know, that one memory of, of taking the tour about Chang at the cradle, how when Biltmore was trying to sell all his forest land, which is now the Pisgah Forest, you know, that Shank was really pushing very hard against it, I think, to the point where he basically got fired over this whole thing, but eventually made it to a point where the U.S. Forest Service then picked up all this land base or bought it to create what is now the Pisca Ranger Discord or the Pisca National Forest. So you have actually that conservation piece and that preservation of that forest land that was managed and then was supposed to be sold off and, and you lose that whole history that happened there, but also all the forest management that, that happened there. And that's the goal now. Um, if Talking Forests is happy to have Hashtag Forest Proud as an in-kind sponsor of the Talking Forest podcasts. What is Forest Proud? We are a community committed to making choices that keep forests as forests. We work at family businesses, forest product companies, conservation, recreation organizations, universities, and government agencies, and many, and many of us have done so for generations. We are hikers, hunters, bikers, landowners, loggers, truck drivers, architects, researchers, foresters, students who work in and care about and share a passion for forests and forest products. The hashtag Forest Proud community is bigger than you might think. What does Forest Proud mean? It's a good question. Forest proud means different things for different people, and that's a good thing. We all have a part to play in making choices that keep our forests as forests and help make our neighborhoods, communities, and lives better. If you live, work, or play in the forests or with forest products, you're a part of the Forest Proud community. Forestproud.org welcomes you. Well, now, um, if you talk about forest proud is to keep forests as forests, um, no matter who owns it, if it, is, if it gets to stay a forest, that's what matters. And so a lot of the misconceptions about um, development is that there's a lot of foresters and forests that are already in place and signed that are already um, helping that to not spread as much. Um, although we can always do more work and to make sure that we are putting in uh, conservation easements and incentivizing um, out here in the United States, the tree farm owners um, from the American tree farm system, they are providing us clean water and um, really helping do things that the public doesn't know about. And so that has been part of my effort in talking forests to talk about the uh, little microclimates and the legacy tree stands and clean water and things that come out of the privatized forest. Although we can't walk through it, um, they are doing that work and they are diversified in their in their planning because they are private. They can do whatever they would like within the forest management laws. Um, so it's really important work. It, it is. And, you know, you have to commend all these private forest landowners that are in the American tree farm system to choose to keep their forest land in forest land. I mean, you, you look around 
in any of these urban areas and how urban cities are starting to to sprawl out if you just look at south carolina charleston how charleston is growing how much development is happening and and you think about how much more money you could make just selling off your property your forest land for development and then you see these private forest owners that make a conscious decision to stay in to keep their property in force in timber and manage the timber and that is something that you know a lot of effort and work has gone into that in education over the past decades right to get to yeah. this point yeah a lot of knowledge and work has gone into that to keep people's minds on keeping forests and um yeah i actually went to charleston south carolina because my husband's uh car was shipped from germany into the charleston port and i went to um downtown and it was really interesting because it kind of reminded me of the the brick um, paved areas in the villages of um, germany and so it really it it was modern though so that was kind of we were we were driving modern cars and in germany they're very much about reusing so a lot of their vehicles um, aren't brand new um, they have older cars and they fix their cars and use the same cars and they like reusing. Um, so it was very interesting for me to go to Charleston and um, it was really interesting to see like a mixture of some of the tropical trees, the broadleaf trees. Um, and I, I would like to continue this work and um, that's why I have this podcast too, is to help inform people of um, urban sprawl and that we can, you know, keep in investing in these programs such as Find Outdoors. The U.S. Forest Service does a great job and they give a lot of grants. Um, they're working on mass timber and cross laminated timber um, funding to help people do those kind of projects. Um, and that was one of my favorite projects in Germany was that um, I found out that they had Baumwitfeldfod. Uh, all right. Um, wooden wooden tree towers. Right. I I'm I'm familiar with that. I've never visited one, but you have basically these whole, you know, path, these wooden bridges, these these hanging swinging bridges high up in the tree canopy, and you can walk basically through a forest stand high up in the in the canopy, yes. between the grounds, and just explore what's going on. I, I believe you're tethered to some cable system so you don't fall down, but. Yeah. There, there's really interesting things happening. I believe they now have it commercialized in a way that you have some restaurants nearby that will actually cater. So you can have your meal up there in the canopy, sitting among the crowns of some really nice tall trees. Yes, you can. And there also was one in Austria. I believe I was in Gmunden and they also had um, the slides. So not only the slides, but they also had uh, the carts that would go down the mountain um, and it was very, very fast. I, I only did it once, but I was definitely scared at the speed that they can go. And you're just strapped in with um, a normal racing seatbelt like you would be in a car. And um, yeah, and but, but what I did trust was the German engineering. <laughs> I, 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 that, that is very good. I'm telling you, I, I love those little runs that you have, these little cars running down, summer toboggan runs or whatever you mm -hmm. call them. And, you know, I take students over to Europe and into Switzerland and Germany, and we have one spot in Switzerland where we had about eight, 9,000 feet elevation where we have one of those runs where we just go up with a lift and then run one of these little carts down the hill in like some switchbacks. And you're right, you're only strapped in with one single harness there. And it's like, man, you know, if, if you start falling off that thing or the, the car leaves the rails, yes. you're, you're in for a ride. <laughs> yeah. A different kind of ride, but um, yes, and I absolutely love the Audubon. I'm, I'm terribly missing this Audubon, um, and you know, luckily I haven't gotten too fast yet or pulled over yet. But I, uh, I really enjoyed that German engineering, and so for that to be involved a hundred years ago in the cradle of forestry, um, I'm really proud of Find Outdoors for their work and I'm really happy that they um, drove me to be able to, t to speak to you today and um, I'm, I'm excited because I talked with Adam from Find Outdoors. I also talked with Adam, the chair of um, Appalachian Society of American Foresters 
Um, and I've talked with other APSAF members, and this um, will be very exciting to have aired along with our photos um, of the memorial. Um, that was a centennial, and I've just been so excited to learn more and talk through with you as a German about all of these things. So very excited to have you on today, and I appreciate your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kendra, for having me. Yes, thank you.